Um, I am not a developer, um, so it's not a very technical session. But it's more let you, to let you know um, what the capabilities are, what tools are available. Uh, I can show some examples of, cu of, uh, of, of, uh, of customizations done um, um, th throughout the system. So uh, one point I'd like to make is, um, is that uh, we take this very seriously, is the difference between configuration, configura configuration and customization. Um, and uh, so, you know, sometimes we'll slip and, and use one word when we mean the other, um, but we'll often catch ourselves and make sure that we're, we're actually talking about um, what, we, what we actually mean. Um, so, so configuration uh, to us is where uh, the user can make those changes and that they don't need to make any code. Uh, and we try to make uh, the solution flexible enough and rich enough um, that a lot of the changes that need to be done can be done that way. So obviously that lowers uh, total cost of ownership, um, that, that makes uh, upgrade a lot easier. Um, so as much as we can do and push into configuration, uh, in our mind, is better. <clears throat> so obviously we can't hit everything that way, and so therefore we take extensibility and customization very seriously. Uh, every feature, uh, every scenario that we, that we address um, through features, um, we, we make sure that we take um, extensibility into account. Uh, so as we write up specifications, extensibility is something that we cover uh, regardless of what it is. Uh, so it could be from the big building blocks, the big components that we have, um, where extensibility is part of the design um, from the beginning, uh, or just to every individual feature that we're creating, making sure that that's extensible. Uh, so it's our hopes to be able to hit 80, 85% of the people's requirements um, right out of the box um, with configuration um, to be able to tweak it to their needs. Uh, but knowing that ISVs, partners, developers uh, are the key to go that extra mile uh, to be successful in a given, in a given vertical uh, or, for, or even just for a given retailer's needs. Um, so this, this diagram here, I'm going to use this diagram. I think we've, we've showed it once or twice before. I'm just going to use this to highlight and talk through the various extensibility points uh, throughout all the different pieces in the solution. Uh, so the first one, which would be the back office piece. Um, so this is, uh, this is the headquarters piece. This is um, uh, AX, um, all the different kind of names that we have for it. But um, this is the back office piece, and it encompasses uh, multiple pieces. Uh, so the AX client is the user interface piece, um, and that's the, part, that's the portion that I've said before can run on any, on any desktop OS, basically, any Windows desktop OS. Uh, the, the AOS is, what this, is that server piece. Um, so when you deploy it, there's a service that's running, and then there's a client that you use to access the functionality uh, through the user interface. And obviously there's a database, a SQL database on the other end. Um, so all of this is extensible. Um, and, and, and it's really the strength of AX as the platform, and it's one of the major decisions in when we chose AX to be the platform for the various industries that Microsoft targets, retail being one of them. And it's that AX itself is a development platform. Um, so when I get into the demo later, I'll show that within AX is a, is a, you know, a fully functioning IDE. Uh, so with a developer license, um, you can get right into all of the source code of AX. So within AX, you can create your own, and you can create and modify your own tables in the database. Uh, within AX, um, right within AX, no other tools needed, you can create new forms, you can create new classes, you can change business logic, um, all right within AX. Now, developers tend to like working in Visual Studio, and that's definitely, uh, that's definitely uh, possible now as well. And they're, they're making um, more tools and, and, uh, and, and improvements in that area all of the time. Um, but even just in the little bit that I'm going to demo, I'll show how you can just do that directly within AX. Uh, the next piece is the, the commerce data exchange, the real-time service. This is what we previously called transaction service. And if you remember, this is what does kind of the real-time checks between uh, the channel, um, whether it's point of sale or... Uh, or the e-commerce um, going through uh, commerce uh, runtime um, back into, the, into AX, and that's extensible as well. So it's actually, uh, it's, a, it's a web service, and um, the, the key, though, is that all of the actual functionality that, that it invokes is uh, within the AOS. So, um, so point of sale or whatever client is on the other side makes a request, um, and those those different methods are all within the AOS. And since you have the source code to those, you can obviously extend and modify those methods. We also have kind of generic methods uh, where you can just pass information in and get information back through. Um, and obviously those are all um, uh, customizable through the AOS as well. Uh, 
Uh, so if you built your so um, if you want to build your own website that yeah. I don't know that that's been decided yet, actually. I know that that's been asked a couple times. I think, I think Michael's basically said that, that that hasn't been decided yet. Yeah, so again, from a technology stack perspective, it's all the same. Um, it would be whether it's, it's available from a licensing perspective. Um, so when you talk about, say, I mean, using building your own website as an example, it depends. There's the front end of the website and the back end of the website. If you're using commerce runtime on the back end of the website, then it's already going to be using this um, out of the box. And if you're and if it's just a third-party front end, then there should be no issues there. Um, the next piece is the, the, the sync service. So Commerce Data Exchange sync service used to be called Store Connect. And this is what does the data replication based on a periodic schedule. So as you send down new products or as you pull up sales information based on recurrence patterns, uh, this is the piece that does that. Now, this is extensible in a couple ways. Um, when we ship it, we ship basically plugins on either side, one that knows how to talk to AX um, through the AOS. If you, if you notice, we never go directly to the AX database, and neither should you. Um, so that's, that's uh, pretty standard practices. You should never go directly through the AX database. AX has methods to be able to get into the data through the database uh, through the AOS. And we never do it, and, and neither should you. Um, so uh, Commerce Data Exchange goes through AOS. The, the component that we actually use is called bc.net, or uh, businessconnector.net, um, which ships as part of the platform. And that's how Commerce Data Exchange accesses data through AX. Uh, so that's extensible in a couple ways, in that there's plugins on either side. So there's a plugin at the store side that knows how to talk to the point of sale database. And there's a plugin on the AX side that knows how to talk to the AX database. Now, obviously, those plugins could be replaced with additional plugins to talk to different things on either side of there. Um, the other aspect of it falls more under configuration than customization, and that's that all of those scheduler jobs that determine which data moves between the different systems is all just in data. So I, I believe I showed that in one of the sessions um, yesterday. And uh, so that's basically done through configuration rather than customization. But if you need to add a table or add a column to a table uh, or create an entirely new job, that's all just done through the user interface, and it's all just data. No coding required. Uh, on the point of sale side, um, so in this diagram, it goes in, it kind of splits point of sale into two pieces, and that's important. Um, there's kind of the core portion of the POS, um, and in that case, um, you do not get the source code to that piece, um, but the interfaces are available um, to be able to uh, work with the extensibility points within the point of sale. And there's three different types. Um, there's services, um, which are actually our plugins. Uh, it goes into a services folder, but uh, we call them plugins when you're looking through the documentation. Um, triggers, which are very similar to what you would know as hooks in RMS, um, and then skins, which would be from a, um, from a visual perspective, being able to create custom themes uh, would be the various extensibility points uh, within the point of sale system. And then next is, um, I, I apologize for the, the quality of the, of the design, but basically I just want to use this to, to, to call out a couple things, is that commerce runtime, um, which is used for the the, the web storefront, as well as retail server to drive the devices that we talked about before, and then uh, and ultimately will be used uh, for the point of sale system as well, uh, for, the, for the current uh, point of sale, um, is basically an extraction of those same services. So when we talk about the add-ins there, um, here, these are actually the same services or plugins that we talk about when we talk about from point of sale. Um, and then this also just, is a, it's a very similar diagram, but it uses these green um, boxes to show where the various entry points are for third-party extensions. So obviously we know AX can, can we, I just talked about how AX can be extended, how Commerce Data Exchange can be extended, the database on that side can be extended, and then within the Commerce Runtime itself, there's various aspects uh, or extensibility points um, for, for ISVs to, to be able to either uh, enhance the existing functionality or actually just replace it with uh, third-party functionality entirely. Great examples there, especially from an e-commerce perspective, would be for shipping add-ins or for tax add-ins. Um, POS extensibility, uh, specifically, um, there's some really good information out there. There's a retail SDK um, that's available. Uh, it actually installs uh, when you install the system, or at least it's an installation option that you want to also install the SDK, uh, where there's code samples, there's uh, projects um, that allow you to get up and running quicker, as well as documentation. 
Uh, also, all the online documentation is part of MSDN, and that's available now. Um, so anybody can go and view the, the documentation there. Um, when we talk about services, again, the, the other name for that is plugins. Uh, but these are all the different um, aspects that kind of hang off of that POS core that, uh, that are extensibility points. Uh, I can't name all 38, but basically there's one for pricing. There's one for, uh, for interacting with hardware. There's one for searching for things. Uh, there's one for taxes. There's one for shipping. So all of the di dif different things that you can do um, from within the, the point of sale or even within the CRT are satellite assemblies that you can then uh, rip and replace with your own or modify them. So when you install the SDK, you get the source code to those 38 uh, services, or those 38 plugins. Uh, one of those services is actually a special one called Blank Operation. Um, in previous versions, you could only have one of those. But basically, a blank operation was a way for you to just do anything you wanted to do. Uh, so obviously, if you're going to modify our pricing rules, you would use the pricing service to do that. But if you wanted to go and talk to some other system for something that's just completely outside of anything that we've considered with our other services, then there was blank operation where it would basically be you know, free reign for whatever you wanted to do. There was a limitation of only being able to have a single blank operation. And with the latest release, we've, we've removed that. So now you can have multiple blank operations. Um, there's over 60 uh, specific triggers, and each of those triggers have pre and post conditions. So if you're familiar with hooks with RMS, that's you know, pre-add item, post-add item, uh, pre-tender, post-tender, pre-print receipt, post-print receipt, uh, various ways to be able to kind of interject, listen for these events that happen, um, and then go and do your custom processing. Um, so there's over 60 of those um, in the point of sale uh, today, and, and we've actually um, added and improved those with each release. Uh, and then finally, also new with this release is from a visual perspective would be the custom theming capabilities. Just to save time, rather than switching through all the custom themes, we actually ship six custom themes out of the box. Um, so without having to write any code, not, not really write code, but use any external tools, um, you can choose from any of these themes, basically. Um, but you can get an idea what you can do with the theming, and you can actually go a lot farther than this. All of our themes are pretty basic. You can see they're all kind of... Um, you know, uh, monochromatic in a sense. Um, but you can actually, you know, get really crazy with the themes. Um, to do the themes, it requires a third-party tool, though. Um, in fact, to do any UI development within the point of sale, it requires a license for third-party controls. Um, so there's a company called DevExpress, and they, cr they, um, they develop and release the, the, the controls that we use for the point of sale UI. Um, so, so when you do any UI, customization, you also need to have a license to be able to do that. Uh, in getting that license, you get the free tool, which is basically the skin editor, which allows you to create your own themes. So with that, we'll move into the demo. And across that, I'll, I'll be able to touch on, uh, on a few of these different extensibility points that we've talked about. There we go. Okay, so the, the customization that I'm going to walk through is the ability to add custom UI into the point of sale. Um, so I'm going to actually start uh, within the back office. And uh, to, to make some of this easier, we've actually made some of, the apps, uh, some of this configurable rather than having to be customizable. Um, so we look for, for areas where we can uh, make things easier by building it into the product, where we know that there's common things that everyone's going to need to do. Uh, so rather than everyone having to figure out their own way to do that, we can build it right in. Uh, so one of those things, uh, and that I'll show a couple examples of, is custom fields. Uh, so it's, it's configured within uh, the back office in the retail area under POS, and you can create your own custom fields here. Uh, so in this case, I'm actually going to create one called uh, user control one. Uh, this actually has to be the name of the, of the control in the DLL, um, so hopefully I get that right or it's not going to work. 
Uh, and in this case, I'm going to do a custom control. So you can see the various types that are available. Um, so product receipt grid refers to uh, in the point of sale UI where you ring up items and they, they're added into the screen. So it's kind of the, the transaction pane um, uh, where items are listed. That's item receipt grid. So you can add custom fields into there. Uh, the payment grid uh, would be the, the, the various payment line items that can also be added in that area. Uh, the totals area, are if you can add custom fields in where we show you know, the subtotal, the tax amount, the de deposit amounts, uh, the count of the number of line items or the number of uh, quantity on there. So you can add your own fields into those areas as well. Uh, on the receipt, um, so on the printed receipt, uh, if you need to add custom fields, you can define them here um, so make it easier in the, in the layouts. Uh, and then what I'm doing right now is I'm actually adding a custom control. So we have the ability to um, provide uh, captions um, through the software also. So I'll show you what this means in a second. It'll be pretty clear. Um, but basically, this is the string ID for the, for the UI that's, that this control is going to use. So I've basically just told the system that I'm, I need to include a new field, or, or in this case, a whole new control uh, in, our, in our screen layout. Um, so I want to have a label on that control, though. So I'm actually going to go into uh, what's called the AOT. Uh, so by pressing Control-D, and I have a developer license, you can actually get into the developer environment within the AX client. Um, so AOT being the, the top node. Um, and then you can see that from here, you can get into all of the tables. Um, so if I expand this out, these are all of the tables uh, that are within AX. If you want to see the retail tables, they're all prefixed with retail. Um, so retail tables start here. Um, in this case, I actually want the retail uh, language text table. I'm going to go ahead and open this up. So again, if you ever wanted to access the database, uh, the recommended way is to go through the AOT, not to go through SQL. Um, so I need to create new records here. Um, so in this case, we don't have a form for the user to be able to enter these, these values. So I'm just going to go directly into the AOT and add them into the database. If we thought this was something a user would do more often, then we would give them UI to do this. But this is more something a developer or ISV would do. Um, so I'm going I'm to give my text for ENUS. And I believe I gave the text ID of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So you can see that you can set different, um, different strings for different languages. And this table will be replicated down to the point of sale. And so what we'll do there is we'll look for the string ID first in our resource files. If that string ID is in our resource files, then we'll use that string. If it's not, then we'll look in the database and use the string from, from the database. So now if I go into my POS layouts, uh, I don't want to mess up one of my existing ones. So I'm just going to take my standard cashier for AdventureWorks and copy it. And I'll call this one custom. And go into the designer. And now if I go into my design mode, I should have my custom control here. There it is, my control. So now I can just add this into the UI as if it was one of the controls that we ship out of the box. You see the string came from the database, my control, so we know what to call that control. And now I can add that to the UI um, just as I could, whether it's the custom area or a logo or an image or resizing or adding button grids. So now this is a, a, a way to be able to use custom controls uh, within this, the screen layouts. So I've actually already set um, the, the user, at least I'm, actually I should probably go double check, um, to use that layout. So remember, layouts can be store-based, register-based, or user-based. So here I've said that this user is going to use a layout ID called custom. So that part is good. I want to send this data down to the store now. Uh, so if I was using my, uh, my scheduled replication, I could wait until the next time these jobs ran, but I don't want to wait that long. So I'm going to send down the registers job because this is going to send down that new uh, layout that I created. And then I'm going to send down the staff job because that's going to send down the fact that this staff member is going to use that uh, layout rather than the one that he had before. 
Exactly, yep. So I basically, I, I defined a new layout in, in the back office, but that layout needs to get to the store. It does, yeah. So, um, so we have different types of jobs. So we have N jobs and we have A jobs. Um, N jobs are kind of brute force. They actually take uh, all of the data and they send it everywhere. Um, so it's typically not the job that you would use um, uh, you know, once you go live, basically. Um, because usually you only want to send the delta and you want to send it to specific places. So N jobs don't do that. Um, but uh, the, the change tracking that the A jobs use um, is actually happens in code. Um, so you want to make sure that if you are changing things directly in the, in the database, you want to make sure that, that the change tracking is enabled there uh, so that we know to send that down. Um, so in this case, though, I'm just going to use the N job. I've sent down the change to the register. I don't remember if I did it yet for the staff member. Okay, so now that goes down to the point of sale. Uh, so there's one important thing I need to do. I actually need to put that custom DLL in the folder. Um, so I'm going to go into the services folder where point of sale is installed. If I don't put this in here, it's not like it'll crash or anything. You'll actually just have a big blank area in the top of the screen. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and copy this in. So this is the custom control uh, that was previously created. It's nothing too excited. Don't get your hopes up. Um, I'll start POS now. And if I named everything correctly, this should work. Okay, so here's my custom control here. So, you know, in this not extremely creative example, it's basically showing who the current worker is. So this is information we already have down in our taskbar here, but just to show that a, a custom control has information um, from the current session, um, so it can know who the current, the current user is. And then just as, you know, sales lines count. So as I add line items, you'll see that the sales line count is being incremented. So in this case, it's using a couple different aspects. Uh, so it's, it's getting information about the current session, it's using triggers to know when lines are added, and then it's showing the, the total line count up at the top. Pretty cool. Uh, whoops, didn't mean to minimize everything. Uh, so the next thing I'll show is, um, is along those same lines, but I'll just show one more example there, uh, is I want to add another column into the receipt pane. Uh, so I'm actually going to start off, and I'm going to add my text in. Retail language text table. I'll add a new row for ENUS. And now I can add a custom field for the product receipt grid as well. I can go back into my layout designer. In this case, I want to add a new column here. Uh, so if I go into the designer and go into the column chooser, oops, it went behind. Sometimes it does that. And I go into the column chooser, oops. <laughs> it's good to have a bigger, higher screen resolution for this. Um, okay, so you can see there's actually a number of columns that aren't in our default layout anyway. Um, so whether an item's blocked, you can have color as a column rather than going in underneath. Um, there's a number of fields that, um, that we just don't uh, include in the grid uh, by default. Uh, but here's my column, the one that I had created. I can add that into the layout. And then sending that down will add the column into, the, into that user's layout. Now, putting data into that column becomes, you know, again, the ISV's responsibility. So if there's, it's either can read additional information about the product that we already have, or you could go do some custom processing to get in information about the product, maybe even from an external system to be able to show that in the, in the transaction screen. So that same capability can be done for a, a control, uh, a column here, a column within the payments grid, um, within the total section, on the printed receipt, um, uh, and, and I, I, think, I think that's probably it uh, throughout the point of sale. Any questions? 
Dev Express license, yeah. Um, what I know is that um, uh, you can, they, they offer their, their products in different ways. Um, what we need is their WinForms licenses, right? So you can buy kind of their, you know, their enterprise package where you get everything. You get Silverlight controls, WPF controls, WinForm controls. Um, uh, you know, basically you get everything that they have. I know that we only use, in this case, uh, their WinForms controls. So that's one decision that, that, uh, that could help you. Um, the next thing is that we actually, you have to get a special version from them to work with our solution. And they know about it. If you tell them that you need the version for Dynamics um, for retail, then they'll know what to give you. But basically there's um, additional security options that Microsoft requires are enabled when those controls are compiled that DevExpress typically doesn't do. Uh, so they enable those, those security options when they compile the controls, and then there's a special version that's available to, to our ISVs and our partners. Yes? That's a good question. I actually haven't, the, the question was, is there parity between the, the hooks that were in RMS and the triggers that are in, um, in Dynamics for Retail? I actually haven't done that comparison myself. Um, I'd have to guess that there, there probably is an issue where maybe one's not there that you're expecting it to be, but, or not. I mean, I, I really don't know, but um, uh, so far, we, any, any, um, any triggers that were missing, um, basically, if, if, uh, if we had developers' ISVs doing extensions in the, over the last three years, anything that was missing, we've added them um, within the next release. So, uh, so the list continues to grow. As far as we know, we've got everything covered that we need to cover, but, um, but certainly if there's something missing, we can always add it. Yes? Yes. Yeah, so that, that's an area that we, that we need to address in the future. Basically, there's, there's one printing DLL, and if multiple people are trying to use it, then, then that's, that, that could be an issue. So, um, so some things that, um, um, that I've heard of being done is where you'll kind of take that one printing DLL and use that almost as a, as a to redirect to, a, to a different DLLs, right? But still, someone needs to be able to go in and to do that work as well. Yeah, yeah, right. So ideally, we would have some better add-in management, um, but to but to date, we don't have that. Yes. I have a question here. Um, all the add-ons here are basic here. You're writing your own code and embedding it in somehow. Okay. Um, what's going to happen with the upgrades? So so we maintain the contracts from version to version. Um, so everything's done through through APIs interfaces where contract backwards compatibility has has been maintained. So that's not to say that we won't ever go through a major redesign where backwards compatibility gets broken or maybe isn't 100%. Uh, but so far, we've maintained backwards compatibility with every release. Is my issue more about when a customer does the upgrade, how much effort for me as, as, as a reseller or a partner that I have to go and recompile my code and re... Is that, is that a process or, or nothing's going to happen? Is there a layer that we, that's separating my part from, from the core? Um, so within AX, so there's, there's different areas to talk about. So within AX, it's a layered architecture, right? So there's, the, there's the, basically the sys layers that Microsoft ships. Um, there's patching layers, so when we release hot fixes that go on top of that. And then there's layers for, for partners' ISVs. And then there's even user layers, so retailers can make their own changes at the very end. Um, those things are all layered where basically one uh, sits on top of the other. When there's upgrades, there are times where, where things have changed or where conflicts need to be resolved. That's, a, that's just a, a, a process that happens uh, for AX development. From a point of sale perspective, um, we maintain all of the, the contracts for the APIs um, from version to version with our, with our plugins. Um, so from that perspective, it should be much easier. You shouldn't need to recompile even, um, except for if we were to go undergo a major redesign or a major, a major change there. And even then, we always keep that in, 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 uh, in consideration. Yes? Um, is there an easy way to take these kind of building things that you've made and uh, move it across different AX components? Like, like, like you kind of use it? So, 
So if you've if you've done a customization and you want to actually deploy that out to places. Yeah, Um, so if if it's um, if it's the if it's a plugin for either CRT or for point of sale, um, then those are just basically those are DLLs. So you could write an installer for it, or you could just drop the files in like I did. And obviously those can be distributed however you'd like, and they can be done manually. Or if it's you know deploying out to many stores, you can use something like System Center to deploy those changes out. Um, if it's an AX change, you can basically take all of the changes that you've made and package those up into an XPO. That can then be, you know, given to someone else. Then they import that XPO. If they've got multiple um, uh, customizations, then maybe they have to do some conflict management there. Yep. But yeah, they, you can package those changes up and 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 provide them to other people. Yes. Well, uh, so it's a SQL database. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> Um, from an AX perspective, um, it's very, very, very strongly recommended not to do that. Um, so some of it is because um, just about everything AX does, even when you're writing a record, um, even directly through the AOT, um, goes through some sort of business rules there. Um, um, the other reason is that AX will do um, some caching um, uh, for performance reasons and for uh, uh, basically being able to uh, scale out across multiple OSs and for performance reasons. So going directly to that database can cause issues where the data is not seen by AX, basically. Right? So you've gone and changed it, and AX doesn't know it changed. So that could be a bad thing. Yeah, exactly. So if you if you if you create a new form in AX, which you know I, I can go back into AX again and show not just the tables, um, but all of the forms are there too. Um, so if I go into the forms, um, and these are all of those same forms. If I go into retail, you'll see here's where all the retail forms are. Um, you can go into the design mode of these forms um, right within um, right within the AOT. You can drag and drop controls as you would uh, as you'd expect in an IDE. So if you do that and you have data access, well then there's classes that are involved in actually writing that data in, through the database that goes through the AOT and everything you're talking about there is handled. Right? You just wouldn't write you know, direct SQL um, to 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 write there. This also takes care of any permissions. Right? So. If you're going to write directly to the SQL database, now that user has to have access to that table in SQL. If you do it through AOT, then users are already managed and permissions are already managed through AX. On the point of sale side, um, we have, we have a, um, through the services, through the APIs, we have ways to get to the data um, in the database and, and the, 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 the information in the sessions. Um, that's not to say that there won't ever be a situation where you have to go directly to the database. We, we want to avoid that when possible, um, but from an AX perspective, you should just never do it. Yes? Correct. Do we have some sort of a document or a metric that tells us what functionality is not available and that service is done? Yeah, I don't know that there's like a, a list that just says here's the stuff. Um, we've definitely documented what aspects use the real-time service. So off the top of my head, I know that um, you know, creating a customer uses the real-time service, creating a customer order, doing a loyalty request, gift card, quantity lookup. Yeah, there, there's, there's quite a bit that happens through there. Um, I don't know that there's just a, a list that lists those all out um, versus having to actually understand uh, what the, the different functionality is. Yeah, but there's some things that can't happen offline. So if I, um, so if I, if I want to create a customer order, so not just a cash and carry sales transaction, but maybe I'm out of stock or they want to go pick it up at store two, that only happens through the real-time service because that order is created in real time in the back office. Yes? Uh, 
Yep, so, so that's exactly what you can do. Yep, so if I, if I go look here, um, uh, I always get there through the schedule, but you can actually go directly to the jobs and subjobs. But if we want, I just want to take an example of, um, of sending products, prices, and barcodes down to the store. Um, so from a user's perspective, this is pretty simple. This means you know anything I need to be able to sell this product, this is the job that's going to send that down there. Um, there's a lot more to that, though. Um, so if I actually go and look at the job itself, you'll see that this job has a set of subjobs, right? So each of these subjobs actually relates to a table. So when I run this job, these are all of the tables that are being replicated between the back office to the point of sale. Um, all of this is just, just defined within data, though. So if I wanted to either create a new subjob or even modify a subjob, I can now go into the definition of the subjob, and you can specify which fields are going to be transferred within this table. So you don't even have to send all of the fields within a table. You can just pick and choose which, which fields you're going to send. So this is basically the field from the back office, and this is the field within the point of sale database. Um, and it's basically saying, take this data from here and put it there. Yep, so, we have, so um, I talked before. I, I don't know why I didn't mention the other jobs. So we have n jobs which push data down, and it pushes all data everywhere. It's kind of the brute force method. It actually even truncates the table on the other end first. So if you're doing that for your items, it actually deletes all of your items and then sends all of your items back down again. So another reason not to necessarily use the n jobs in production. Um, the a jobs work on change tracking. Um, so I'll actually take a couple minutes and explain this a bit better. Um, so we have uh, methods throughout AX in the back office that when a record is changed, we create what we call a pre-action, which basically just says that this product is, or this, this record has been changed. Um, and those pre-actions will just, you know, they'll keep building up as, as records are changed. We have a, a process that runs periodically, again, probably every few minutes or so, that then takes those pre-actions and converts them to actions, and it does that intelligently. So it's not going to create multiple actions for the same thing, or it's going to create actions based on where that data is supposed to go. So again, end jobs send the data everywhere. In some cases, if this item's not sold here, then there's no need to send that data there. So a jobs can be location aware as well. Um, and so basically that happens through that process. Uh, a pre-action gets created, the pre-action gets created to an action, and then when the job runs, it sends the data where it needs to go. It's just the delta, and it's just the, the, the data that needs to go where it needs to go. Um, the, other, the last type would be the p-job. So this is kind of your pull job. Uh, and in this case, it's, it's exactly you know, what, it, what it sounds like. It's pulling the data from the store into the back office. And these, have, these jobs have subjobs also, and you can create and modify subjobs within this job. So if you, yeah, so if, if you've created an add-in in the point of sale that's collecting additional information, um, you actually you probably want to have that information back in AX also. So you'd want to modify the job to pull it up. You'd modify your AX database so you have somewhere to put it. And then if it's data that you need to be able to view or act on, you could create a form that would allow you to modify and access that information. Yeah? Any other questions? Yes, over here. It's the same. It's the same. The question was if extensibility um, endpoints or extensibility processes or capabilities are the same between um, you know, a, a Dynamics Retail Enterprise and Dynamics Retail SMB, it's the same. I believe it is. And that require for each, each install, or is that kind of on a developer's platform? Or? Is Michael in here? <laughs> I saw him a minute ago. I don't know. I've never had to buy a license before, so I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, so actually, just so you know, the, the, the VM that's available on Partner Source has a developer's license, right? So this same VM that I'm using is on Partner Source right now. So if you want to be able to go in there and, and play around and see what it's capable of, you can use this VM to do that. But to actually be able to distribute code other, elsewhere, you actually need a real developer's license. And Michael, I don't know if you can speak to that or not. Yeah, and so the, I don't have all the details on the cost of that, <clears throat> but um, it's similar to a lot of the other licensing discussions we've had. Is there'll, there'll be differences in how we address that for SMB versus other. Um, but we can follow up on that for you. So. Yes. Not exactly an extensibility question, but I um, didn't see in SMB any notion of omnichannel or the SharePoint building architecture. 
Yeah. Did you speak to that? Um, so, I, I mean, I think that um, that question's come up quite a few times. From a, uh, from a technical perspective, it's all the same system. Um, so there'd be no reason why uh, you wouldn't be able to do that. It comes down to, from a licensing perspective, uh, basically whether a uh, retail server for the devices or uh, CRT and the, the SharePoint part falls under SMB or not. And yes, yeah, so from a strategic standpoint, the idea is that e-commerce would be SMB and the, the SharePoint, that capability and that omni-channel would be part of the, any version of the retail solution. So, yes, back there. You can, yeah. You still need a developer license to be able to do it, yes. It's just to be able to use tools that developers are more familiar with. They'd, most developers would rather use Visual Studio than, than use the kind of the built-in IDE in, in AS. So there's an IDE to that? Yeah. 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 Also for things like Source Depot integration, stuff like that, uh, debugging capabilities. Yes? Um, that's actually, so, uh, should I answer that or should you? <laughs> okay, so, so from, a, from a technical perspective, you don't, there's, there's, so when I talk about a developer's license that allows you to actually go in and change the code in AX, that's a developer's license that you need. You do not need, a, technically do not need a developer's license to say drop in a custom DLL into the point of sale. So what I don't know is like from a, a, a license agreement, like from a legal perspective, if there's any special license you need to have to do POS customizations, like you do AX. I don't, I don't no, know. I mean, there's, there's not. We're, we're looking at that, but there isn't today, no. We can open it up to any questions. We still have a, f a few minutes left. Yeah. Oh, I have no idea. I just, <laughs> no, to me, I, I, I can never find anything on partner source, so. <laughs> I'm told it's there. I don't know where it is. Thank you, folks. It's been nice. I'll be stepping out of the room now. Wow. Do you know where it is? Could, Could you find it on partner source, Michael? <laughs> to, to, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, so to Jeff's point, uh, partner source is a dizzying labyrinth of uh, links and feeds and it's, yeah. So because people were going cross-eyed trying to navigate it, we have created something called um, the Retail Training Academy. And one thing that we'll be communicating to all of you coming out of this is links to uh, the Retail Academy we did in Houston last March, the one we did in October in Seattle, which has 20-some-odd uh, hours of presentations, content. It's got all kinds of decks. It's, it's, it's this, but much deeper. And the VM and how to access the VM, the, the requirements from a hardware standpoint to run the VM, all of that's going to be made available to you coming out of this. So you'll be looking for a communication uh, shortly, and we'll give you all of that access so that you can you know, go in and follow up and start to really dig into this as we, uh, as we go forward. Sorry. Yeah, now you're sorry. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, so the, um, the, the high level answer is yes. So basically the, um, the, the, the mobile devices use retail server. Retail server hosts CRT. CRT has those same services or plugins that, are, that I talked about in the point of sale there. Now whether there's any made minor differences between them, that, that could be, um, but it's definitely the same model. Yeah, so, so, um, so commerce runtime is what is all the business rules um, that in the, the version that we're shipping now is used for, uh, for e-commerce. Um, those same business rules came from the point of sale, um, but it's, it's, um, uh, it's they, those, those plugins have become what is known as CRT. 
So in the future, the, the, the existing point of sale will also use kind of an extracted version of, the, of its own plugins um, so that it's CRT everywhere. Um, retail server uses CRT now. So, so the, the slide that basically shows that blue box of CRT, CRT, CRT um, is partial reality right now, basically. So SharePoint, yes. Retail server, yes. Point of sale, it's the same plugins. It's the same source code that was used in both places. But technically and semantically, it's not actually um, the same CRT used elsewhere. But that's definitely the, the direction that we're moving in. So from retail service, server perspective, which we use to drive those devices, yes, it's the same model. Um, from a UI perspective, obviously, those clients are different. Um, so, so, uh, so there'd be some differences there, basically. Yes? Um, so the, the one that I showed you um, was, I believe, um, well, actually, we wrote that one for Windows Phone 7. Um, so it was a special version of Silverlight that was available in Windows Phone 7. Still works in Windows Phone 8. Um, by the time we um, kind of do the, the next revision of it, um, that'll, that'll be rewritten. The, for the Surface, the, what, what you saw on the Surface was actually um, WCF using XAML. Um, and actually, we're rewriting that now to probably use HTML5. So, so our idea is there is that we're going to have multiple clients. Um, so multiple clients, uh, so one targeted for, say, Surface and Slates, one for phone, um, potentially iPhone, Android. Um, so we're looking at all the different technology and what's going to be uh, the best there. But what you saw um, was basically uh, Silverlight for the phone and uh, w, WPF um, and XAML-based design. Um, so we use Visual Studio, yeah. So those are extensible, right? all, the, all the different things. Yeah, so the business rules of, uh, of those devices are all from Retail Server, which is CRT, which has plugins and is extensible. From a UI perspective there, um, the, the current thinking is that we'll basically give source code to those ways as well, right? So you'll have source code, you can take, take, to, take it as a starting point and then build on top of that. Uh, SMBF serial number support, yes, it does. Yep. So it's not exactly, that's one of those check boxes that, you know, if I'm going down a spreadsheet, I'd say, yep, it's got serial numbers, RMS has serial numbers, and we'll move on. The, the functionality is, is, is different. Um, so there is serial number support, but it's done slightly differently. Oops. Oh, well. <coughs> Maybe time for one more question if we've got it. could be about anything that we've covered. So if you want to open it up to other topics, except for partner source. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what we'll do is we kind of laid that out. So the um, we're going to be making uh, training available about mid-year. So we'll, we'll have roughly five days deep technical training. We'll be making that available. Um, beta versions of the product, early versions that you'll be able to get a hold of and start working with since you have enough of a runway before the launch at the end of the year. Um, coming out of this, as I said, we're, we're going to get you links to the VM of current product um, and other materials that's available from a training standpoint. So when it comes to the development environment that Jeff covered, uh, e-commerce, mobility, all the things that you've heard about, we have hours and hours of recorded uh, material that we'll make available to you so that you can start consuming that at your own pace. Uh, and then once we hit mid-year, um, all the SMB specific materials will be ready for us to go. One, one question that I've been asked around here today a lot uh, is about the components that we spoke about in terms of the next gen. Mm -hmm. uh, in RMS, we have HP and HP Manager. We have the Store Manager and the Point of Sale. Um, as I understood that the Store Manager and the HP Manager in terms of functionality It depends on who the user is, basically. Yep. Is. yep. But there is a component that, to me, is, is, is missing, which is where do I define the stores and the uh, um, access rights and the, and the distribution of, of information? Who has what? Is that another component, another layer on the server, on the, on the, on the um, HQ server? Um, so it's actually done just within, within the AX client. So this, this isn't the, the right VM or the right machine with SMB on it. Um, but really, things don't don't necessarily change here. So it is exactly the same like, like the others. 
yeah, it might be, you know, we'll move it to the retail page if it's not there already. But basically, um, if you go into uh, system administration, this is where you define your users. Um, so these are the users of, of the back office system. So if a manager has access to this, then that manager would be created as a user here. And then within this, they're given roles and privileges of what they can and can't do, exactly. Um, so just to uh, fill that out. Uh, POS users, it's slightly different. So POS users are workers. This, this, user, this, this person may also be a user in the back office, and you can actually link them together so that we know that it's the same person. Um, but uh, a POS user does not have to be a back office user. They just become a worker, and their privileges are done um, within here. So basically, they're given um, POS permissions by, by being applied to a, a, a role group, basically, a permission group. Uh, or it can be modified on each particular, uh, each particular user. And that would be the same SMB or, or not. Would that make it synchronized with all of the Azure users? Um, yes. Well, so um, the short answer is yes. You can, you, can, uh, you can not do that if you don't want to. So basically, I talked before in a different session about how we use address books to determine which employees can work where. Um, so if you create an address book for each store and only the employees that work at that store in that address book, then we won't send that employee information everywhere. If, no, no, no. So if I'm if I if I work at this store um, and I'm in I'm in that store's address book, then we will replicate that database to that data to that store's database so that I can log in. Yep, it's managed in the back office, but we push that data from the back office to the point of sale. Okay, and so there is no scenario where I have to go back to headquarters to find my login system, or is there? Um, so when you say back to headquarters, it's one application, okay. and it's being the server is in one place, right. but if you can imagine accessing that, that same application as a merchandiser in headquarters, or as a store manager at the store, you're going to get different experience based on who you are and what your privileges are. So there could be a situation, especially if the store manager is allowed to hire and create their own workers, where you're at the store, you're accessing the data through the AX client, um, and you're creating your own workers and giving them permissions and setting up users for them. So, so if I lose that link, mm -hmm. then I lose a huge amount of functionality. I don't, I don't know which link you would be losing. Correct. You would not be able to do management tasks. Yep. Uh, one theoretical question. At the time you hypothetically with some other partners about single store, single point of sale retail, based on the current pricing structure, um, would I be correct in saying you need point of sale, back office, server component, which equates to roughly three grand, and then you need a server operating system somewhere in there with a, at least some kind of limited domain. Is that a yeah, all of the components that you would need for 100 stores, you would need for one store. Okay. Yep. And yeah, I mean, to be, to be clear, you know, we've said this in a few other sessions, but it bears repeating that this is not, so for single store, our vision is that in 2014, when all of this goes into the cloud and it's all Azure hosted, that's the better scenario to start thinking of single store, because you can tell from the way Jeff's described the architecture, this is starting at the second store, it's optimized for managing two plus. When you're down to that single store, it, it does become a, a heavier burden to try to manage all of the pieces. That, that makes great sense. Just making sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and thanks for asking that question because people have asked that individually, but now for the whole room to get that question is a good thing. Yeah.